had the second series to be Quill, 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 Quillin? No, Quill, not Quill. Quillin. We're all in one group, and two of them got positive, and I never got positive. In fact, I did a rapid test just before I came. You, you know what? You know what they do in it all? All this incessant international travel. So their theory, and this is to some surprise to me, I have a lot of uh, T cell. Uh, you know, antibodies for general coronaviruses from all mixed from all over the world, and that saves me. <laughs> Who knows? My family doesn't even know me. It's unstable. Yeah. Yeah. He had everything from freshmen to uh, mid-career professionals. Got it. Law school students, MBAs. Yes, it's a, uh, well, I would describe it as a quintessential, very sharp uh, general audience. Yeah, yeah. I think it's all the questions that are the same. Yeah. Okay. The way we're doing this this quarter, um, two, three hundred people online does seem ridiculous. Uh, yeah, 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 unfortunately, if you do Zoom, you can set it up as a webinar and I can submit yeah. questions, but it, for some reason, we haven't got that worked out here. We keep switching every, every month or so. Very cool. Yeah. This may seem like a small audience, but compared to the athletes used to playing in front of 10,000, we have uh, up until recently just friends and family. There's 150 people here. What you need to do is what they do is they put uh, cut out the family members for the ones that can't make it. That's about it. The, the problem is the students have these long lectures between classes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten minutes, and if you're late for them, uh, they'll tell you for it. Didn't know what it Good afternoon and welcome to uh, this afternoon's energy seminar. Uh, today we have a real treat, John Deutsch, uh, professor of chemistry emeritus and institute professor at MIT, uh, prior to COVID was uh, coming out and uh, visiting us every winter quarter for two or three in a row and then COVID hit and he hasn't been able to do it till now. And here he is back again. Uh, if you've read his bio, you know he's one of the world's experts on national security and energy and related topics, having had high-level government uh, positions and advisory board uh, positions. So he's one of the uh, most prominent strategic thinkers across this landscape, adding in nowadays uh, international competitiveness and uh, sustainability, I guess. And he's picked a very pr provocative subject for his talk to you. He'll be around giving other lectures until the end of March, end of March. Uh, and that is uh, the emerging uh, revolution in U.S., United States industrial policy. So I think it's an extremely um, uh, timely topic, and I'm sure he's going to draw the links to energy, which are all around us on cable news. So, John, take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Good. Uh, and I want to say that I uh, prefer this to be kind of a discussion. I'm open to comments. Uh, Inquiries, congratulations at any time during the, uh, just just lift your hand and I'll call on you. We can have a, a discussion here and perhaps make it a little bit more 
uh, stimulating than just having me go on now. Uh, I should tell you that I've been coming to Stanford as a guest since the early 1980s. So I've been here a lot. In fact, I believe that I first met John Wyant when he was here as a graduate student. So that's how far back I go. Uh, and the second thing is, as he says, I come from MIT. I've been at MIT for half a century, more or less. And uh, I love MIT, but I also love Stanford. Now, you're going to be hearing from me today a lot about, or not a lot, something about um, this, the strategic uh, challenge that we have from China. But I come from MIT, and I really think that the strategic challenge for MIT is actually Stanford, not China. So, so uh, what I'm going to speak to you about is the tremendous change that has taken place in the traditional uh, industrial policy of this country, of the United States. And that traditional view, which has been hammered for a long time, uh, is that the federal government's responsibility is basically for growth, employment, stability. That means not too much deficits, not too much inflation. It raises taxes in order to support the uh, underlying uh, infrastructure of the country, uh, roads, uh, airports, railroad stations, uh, public health, environment, and things which involve the whole commerce of the country, or national security. The government gets really involved in the business and the activities of the country if there's a war, like there was the Second World War, uh, with the War Production Board going, coming in and really running all the production of the country for uh, the period of the, of the war. In other times, when there is not an absolute uh, war going on, there's a great suspicion about the federal government's ability, great suspicion about how the federal government's ability to direct private corporations to do things, their investments, or to run investments themselves. So suspicions which are based on the fact that the government does, know, does not have the, in, inside the government the skills or the uh, experience to do that properly. The great, great suspicion. Today, that situation is completely changed. And I believe that most of my friends around this country do not realize, even as they read in the newspapers, what bills are being considered by the Congress. They do not realize what a revolutionary change we are experiencing at this moment about how the United States government is going to handle its industrial policy going forward. It's a very aggressive new policy. It's uh, got enormous, enormous scope, an enormous amount of money going into it. There are three extra zeros in the bills that are being passed by Congress. You're getting either trillions or hundreds of billions in different uh, uh, efforts to uh, do industrial policy, where there used to be just a few tens of millions. So it's a complete change. And uh, it is also very important to notice that it is supported quite strongly by both Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate, although the weighting that they give to different parts of the industrial policy are quite different, it is amazingly strong bipartisan support, which is one of the reasons why these bills in one form or another uh, are going to pass into the uh, country. The key pe pe feature that I want to tell you, which is even more uh, uh, surprising, is that there is a massive, massive protectionist element in these bills. There are pages after pages. There are, these are bills are hundreds of pages long. You have to, you know, to spend hundreds of billions of dollars, you better lay it out in hundreds of pages. But there are massive sections about what we should do to uh, meet the uh, Chinese threat to the United States and to the American people. It is really quite, quite dramatically strong and I might say not, not altogether uh, either, in my mind, rational or certainly uh, sympathetic in any way. So uh, I put at the bottom of this slide, just as an example, uh, the Wall Street Journal editorial last week about a bill, which we will talk about in a moment, which it said it, was, it just scathingly attacked the bill for the amount of industrial policy that was in it. And the way their headline said it says, Be More Like China Act. That is, it seemed like with all of this China, China, China throughout the bill, 
It was really a call for the United States industry to be like China, which of course is quite impossible for a series of long series of reasons, that that was the purpose of the bill. And they also said that the bill had in it very much of what was mixed with, or, you know, basically welfare, welfare for the private corporations of the country. Very, very critical bill. That bill is the House of Representatives bill. It is not, so it's the one which is still very much, uh, uh, or I won't say largely, but slightly uh, controlled by uh, the Democratic Party. So it's a, a dramatic change. And I want to describe that change to you and its different aspects and its implications. And with that, I'll, does anybody here have a question or a comment or this? All, everybody all set? Ah, I've got to do this myself. So what is, what is causing this dramatic change? And there are three reasons that are causing it, three drivers. The first, as I said, is this uh, concern about China and how China is behaving in the world, now we're talking about in the economic world, both globally and with respect to the United States. In 2015, China published, for everybody to read, a, uh, a, a, a plan which they called China 2025, which was a plan about how China was going to, and China's industry, was going to reach global technology leadership over the United States by the year 2025. And they didn't say this only, first of all, they mentioned the United States explicitly. They said, that is our goal. We are going to displace the United States from its technological uh, leadership. And it explained how it was going to do it. And because it's China, there were many, many subsidiary plans from different agencies to support that strategic uh, picture, which was placed by uh, the uh, original uh, China 2025 report. It's really quite a compelling report. It says, here's what we're going to do, and we're going to do it because we want to have economic de uh, dominance around the globe, and especially with respect to the uh, United States. Now, uh, what, what, what it reflects is that China has, over the last couple of decades, really dramatically improved its technical performance as a country. Its engineering is really gotten better and better. It's able to produce goods, especially manufactured goods, at great uh, speed, great speed and in innovation, lower cost, and higher quality. So the first thing that one has to ad admit, which is of course nowhere admitted in the Congress of the United States, is China is just getting better and better because they're working harder and harder and doing well. But the gap between China and the United States is, is inexorably closing, both with regard to the economic competitiveness in the markets of the world, but also intellectually with respect to innovation uh, in, their, in their country. So uh, my first trip to China was in uh, 1978. Uh, I was the director of energy research of the Department of Energy. I went with a secretary, Jim Schlesinger, uh, met with Deng Xiaoping. When you walked across the uh, Beijing, you could not see a car, not a single car in all of, in all, in all of Beijing. Not, and certainly no private vehicles whatsoever. There were some limos for us. But, so the amount of progress is truly uh, dramatic, and it's, uh, it's substantial progress, real progress. <clears throat> now, uh, so there's a tremendous amount of concern in Congress about illicit Chinese activities. Now, there's no question about the fact, I can tell you this with some certainty, that there is Chinese behavior, is, uh, there is some theft of US technology from uh, corporations, from the government, and from others. That's not a surprise. It's always there. But there's tremendous concern about that theft. Uh, concern, especially among our political leaders, again, I want to underscore, of both parties. Now, in fact, China doesn't behave with such crudity. What China has done, it's seen that the United States is an open, an open, has an open innovation system, especially at the front end, at, uh, the idea of uh, idea generation in universities, uh, 
Uh, and so what it's done is it's constructed a way of taking advantage of the openness of the US system completely legally. I'll give you one example of this. Huawei, I'm, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, they have this uh, program where they sponsor open research by a Huawei technical person and a faculty person at a US university, gives them grants for three or four years, all the publications are open, all the material is open, but these two individuals, one from Huawei, one from the university, work together, and that information gets, goes back to, to China, of course, and it does, in fact, have a great uh, ability to improve their early stage innovation, which is quite, quite uh, not as well advanced as their engineering and manufacturing capability. So when you hear these concerns about China, and I'll come back to this as it, uh, as it applies to universities such as Stanford, uh, it is really not so much that they're behaving illicitly. They do plenty of that you know, with trade problems, uh, things like that, but they're doing it by taking advantage of our open system. So that's something to, to keep in mind. The concern really started very seriously with the enormous growth of photovoltaics installed in utilities and homes around the United States. When the photovoltaic arrays that were being put either in, in arrays on, on, of, to a grid or on a home roof, all of those uh, uh, arrays were actually manufactured in China or in, more, more recently, as time went on, in other Asian nations, they were imported to the United States. And the United States put those arrays in China on US buildings, factories, and homes. Uh, they did the same thing in Europe. There's a lot of discussion about whether they did this at a fair price or at a, uh, whether they were dumping the uh, arrays. But the fact of the matter is it took jobs from American firms, which would be manufacturing these arrays, and that creates universal, universal opposition when something like that happens from uh, uh, all members of Congress. So that concern about photovoltaics and the very significant uh, story that it, it tells led the uh, United States political leaders, our political leaders, to be concerned about batteries, about electric vehicles, about a host of other things. And there are also, in the course of this, the Chinese uh, described what some of their, their 11 key technologies that they really cared about that they thought would be act as uh, platforms for future technical growth. I've mentioned a few of them here in this chart, but they only mentioned ones which they knew were, they were more uh, likely to be able to do than some others. Like, for example, they don't say anything about uh, uh, biology problems or about uh, uh, synthetic biology, for example. Other areas, there are areas where the United States still has a profoundly great uh, advantage over China. But the concern that the, uh, these particular technologies, we'll be talking a bit more about semiconductors, uh, is one of the key concerns that shows up in the legislation that we're... And the third driver of this new revolution is the awareness that the United the world is going too slowly at cutting uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, go, not going to achieve the goal of staying under two degrees uh, by the end of the century uh, as a global temperature increase. And that in order to do that, <coughs> one had to adopt a different point of view. And what they've done is Europe and the United States and other countries as well have adopted specific years like in the case of the United States, 2050, when our economy will be net zero in carbon emissions. Now, we may later on in conversations want to talk about how likely is that, or is it a proper or an intelligent uh, government um, instruction to say that we want a point certain, a specific year, 2050, where we will be net zero. You're driving for a year as a goal before you know that you can achieve it or have a plan for achieving it. But that <clears throat> notion that there was aggressive, that there was need for aggressive action to reach these net zero goals correctly was joined with the notion that we have to do a lot more, the government has to do a lot more in investing 
in industry infrastructure and especially innovation if these goals are going to be reached. So this, these are the three drivers of change for uh, uh, U.S. Uh, industry uh, policy. Very, very strong, and they're there today. So let me go on to the next slide. So here I'm going to just briefly go through four or I guess five different pieces of legislation and how, where they're at. They're all, these are all less than six months old. I hope they're all less than six months old. In any event, these six describe how much energy and, and singleness of purpose there is in both the executive branch and in Congress on these questions. Uh, it build, comes first with the very ambitious Build Back Better uh, Act that was proposed by President Biden that included huge amounts of money, $550 billion for uh, infrastructure and energy and climate, but lots of other measures for so socially important uh, U.S. goals, uh, extending uh, child care credits and the like. <clears throat> and that Build Back Better Act was $1.7 trillion. It passed the House. It could not pass the Senate, famously known because of the opposition of one Democratic senator, Joe Manchin. And so it just failed. I'll come back to what some of the contents of that ambitious bill were. The Senate, in its place, passed the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, just a mere $250 billion. <clears throat> and I just draw your attention here to two of this hundreds and hundreds of pages of this bill, two different aspects of it that might interest you. First thing they said is the National Science Foundation should, uh, in addition to doing its support of basic research, if fundamental research, early stage research, <coughs> that the National Science Foundation should develop a new uh, directorate for uh, technology. So this is, comes in, the, comes in Sort of the story here is, uh, if, you, if it's not broken, you shouldn't try and fix it. So one of the things the National Science Foundation does very well is to support fundamental research across science and engineering disciplines in the United States. It has no experience in technology development or managing technology transfer to the private sector. So the idea that there's going to be a new technology branch to do this in the NSF, you might celebrate this it's meaning that the National Science Foundation will be more concerned with introducing technologies into the United States, introducing innovation. I think mean, you might worry about saying, well, listen, if they're good at uh, f you know, fundamental research, early new ideas, uh, why don't we let them stay and do that and not try and paste something on top of it? More strikingly and more important for universities, and certainly for Stanford and for MIT, so included in here was a provision which asked CFIUS. What is CFIUS? The Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. It's the Department of Defense uh, Committee, an interagency committee run by the Department of Defense. <coughs> its original purpose was to make sure that there weren't foreign investments into military, military firms in the United States. And if there were, there would be certain conditions under which that would be allowed to proceed or not. Now, the Act says that uh, universities <coughs> must report to CFIUS, and CFIUS must review, should review, all gifts or contracts from the People's Republic of China, which are over a million dollars annually. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, provision. It basically says we're going to have, you know, I, I, I worked in the Department of Defense for a long time, and I know CFIUS quite well. Uh, these are not, you know, uh, world-class athletes. They are narrowly focused. To ask them to start reviewing gifts and contracts from universities like, uh, that's really a far, a, a bridge, a long bridge away. Uh, interestingly, interestingly, Congress really didn't have the courage to do what said that they wanted to do. They didn't give CFIUS the authority to do anything. The word here is review. 
And elsewhere it says, and they don't have authority to stop any of this. They're just a traffic cop who is getting information, storing it, and keeping it. So we know what the, and in this sense, I, have, I must say I have a great, great sympathy with congressional members, the greed of leaders of universities about acquiring more uh, resources, both for their endowments and for the support of their research from, from Chinese firms and individuals is really quite, quite significant. So you can understand, on the one hand, presidents of universities have to raise dough. On the other hand, it does uh, open uh, the uh, avenue for a, mu a much greater relationship between technology creation in the United States and technology transfer to China. <clears throat> By the way, none of it illegal, but it expresses Congress's concern about this ex uh, exchange at the university level. Now, uh, the next piece of legislation was this H.R. 451, which is the uh, bill that the House passed just a couple of weeks ago to be the replacement for the break, build back better bill that did not pass. It was going to be the bill which represented the House's view to uh, go to, with the Senate, set its bill on innovation and competition, <coughs> to go to a uh, conference and to produce one bill to reach the President Biden's desk, presumably early in the spring. That's the bill that caused my great Wall Street Journal people to go drop off the roof and say, this is too much. There's all that's in this bill is making us look like China. It also subsidies for everybody in the private sector. That's what raised back the old and well-established view the United States government should not be in the business of dealing with private commerce. So that uh, bill uh, <coughs> um, is the partner for uh, Build Back Better, which didn't pass. And the final bill is that I'm going to mention to you is the uh, Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act, which has passed. It's not only passed, <coughs> money has been appropriated over multiple years to carry out this uh, 1.4 trillion. Now, you know, if you said to most uh, experienced people in the government, what is the chance that Congress will vote you that much money without doing an annual uh, review? So this is not, this is not a, a money which is just authorized. This is money, it's authorized, and you now have the uh, authority to go out and spend it. At this level, is very, very unusual, very unusual. And we'll come back to some of these. Uh, interestingly, the one little line in there says, <coughs> excuse me, the Department of Energy should set up an office for clean energy demonstrations. <coughs> because even Congress said, if we're going to give these billions of dollars to the Department of Energy and other agencies, there has to be some knowledge, there has to be some capability in those agencies to actually implement the programs that we're directing them to to, 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 to. In point of fact, these agencies have little, have no historical experience in doing it. And so to, to say that you can, in a period of months or a little time, implement these huge programs is just silly. <coughs> and authorizing an office is one thing, but making sure that it's gets the capability, the people, the experience to actually carry out these programs and implement them as desired is a completely different thing. It shows that implementation, that'll be my final point to you, is really key here. I don't know why I'm coughing so much. Meanwhile, we have the new Biden administration and a new uh, head of the National Security Council and a new head of the National Economic Council and in January, just after he was uh, inaugurated, he, uh, he told them to submit a report for four government agencies to talk about the uh, manufacturing and the, uh, the, the mess of the, what was needed to be done in four different areas of uh, the country's economy. And they produced a 250 report, 250 page report, and, uh, with the following. Um, different uh, sectors looked at. 
the Department of Energy for large format batteries. <clears throat> These are batteries which are appropriate for electric vehicles. Uh, the second one was critical materials. Was there going to be enough cobalt or nickel or uh, lithium to build the batteries that were uh, required and the, for this and other things and for the um, semiconductors that were going to be built? Uh, the Department of uh, Commerce for the semiconductors, which we seem to be uh, doing very badly compared to other countries. And finally, for pharmaceuticals, <coughs> where we probably, we still do have a substantial advantage in the world's marketplace. So these were detailed, administration-led roadmaps of areas that required policy by the federal government to advance themselves, to be advanced. So now we now have Congress has passed the bills. <clears throat> the administration has at least started the process of indicating where they're going to go in four key areas, and uh, there we are. Now I want to give you some examples of what is, are in the bills in which now <coughs> the administration is uh, got money for and intends to uh, pursue. First, uh, and these are the, the, I'm now only talking about the infrastructure and jobs bill, which is one which has been passed and all the money has been appropriated. Eight billion dollars over five years to provide for the development of at least four hydrogen hubs across the United States. Hubs which will be providing hydrogen for an undefined purpose for use by the industrial and transportation sector and power sector. Congress then says to the agency, the Department of Agency, that they have 180 days to en enact uh, a process and select at least these four regional hubs. There's not a person in, co in the Department of Energy who has done this, has been prepared for this. Spending that level of money with any degree of responsibility takes a lot of time and thought even if it's done by talented and experienced individuals. And uh, uh, they have to uh, select within one year four of, four, four of these hubs, hubs for the $8 billion. That's really pushing the system quite a bit. In the breakthrough, uh, better, the Better America bill, uh, which did not pass, there were uh, other <coughs> proposals for uh, hydrogen, which are really quite startling. You, you might reflect on this. You might say, well, maybe this is the right thing to do. I actually think it is a very correct thing to do if it's done right and properly and carefully. They proposed $3 per kilogram tax credit for hydrogen that was produced with, uh, basically from electrolysis or from fuel cells with no carbon emissions at all. That $3 per kilogram tax credit is equivalent to saying that they're paying $23 per metric ton of CO2 avoided. <coughs> because presumably the uh, hydrogen, when it's produced, is backing out, in the case of this calculation I used here as an example, natural gas, and therefore the equivalence on energy basis is they're backing out <coughs> $23 per metric ton of CO2. Uh, it also says that if uh, they give this tax, that hydrogen now becomes competitive with natural gas for electricity generation <coughs> if, the hydrogen, if, the, if the methane, the natural gas, is $3 per uh, 1,000 cubic feet, which is about its price today. So it is a regulatory demand pull regulation which makes hydrogen economically competitive with natural gas. Instead of a subsidy for building hydrogen plants, it is a way of rewarding people uh, who produce the hydrogen on a kilogram basis. Uh, the last thing uh, I want to mention as an example of these three is in the uh, uh, Senate bill uh, <clears throat> and, in the, and in the administration, uh, in the Administration Department of Commerce submission, there is a requirement or there's a for $52 billion uh, to subsidize the United States semiconductor industry. Most of that money's going to end up within a few miles of uh, Stanford, but that's okay. I don't 
resent that too much, but there it is, $52 billion. The title of this bill is CHIPS, is what it's called. Everybody refers to it as CHIPS. Creating Helpful Incentives to Produce Semiconductors for America. Now, I don't, couldn't think of a phrase which better illustrates this new industrial policy than to say, <clears throat> Congress, the administration, are showing, picking out industries, specific industries, for significant subsidies because they believe they need that to be competitive uh, in the future in a critical technology, in this case, semiconductors. And their target here is entirely China. Uh, there are two points of scale here <coughs> which I ask you to note. The first is they're, they're given $52 billion. China is, is, is said to, I don't know that this is true or not, it is said is spending $500 billion on semiconductors. A factor of 100. Is it 100 or 10? 10. 10. I occasionally make small mathematical mistakes, which should not threaten the force of my arguments. Uh, when I was a little boy, we did something called Semitech. We set up at a time when we thought that Japan was going to drive us into the world, into the ground. We set up something called Semitech, uh, regrettably in Texas. And uh, <coughs> Semitech was there to uh, make sure that we did much better and advanced our technology in uh, flat panel displays, high resolution flat panel displays, and certain kinds of uh, microelectronics. Uh, the size of that whole investment in, in, in Semitech was, I'm going to try again, a factor of 10 less, $5 billion. So you can see how, how much the numbers have, have changed here. Uh, however, there's a little, another little problem. If you ask, well, what is the best, technically best, and from a business point of view, best semiconductor, highest, you know, the, or, or the, I guess, thinnest line divisions, company in the world, turns out to be a Taiwanese company, T -M TSMC, by a lot. Uh, and then the next best is probably in Korea. It's not in China. This bill and chips, of course, completely overlooks the fact that while they're trying to help the United States become competitive and really do it to overcome China, it may in fact be creating really quite significant disadvantages for uh, uh, countries which are much more friendly and much more freer, like the United States in uh, Taiwan and in uh, uh, Korea, South Korea. So um, there's some, whenever you're trying to do these kinds of radical surgery at massive scale in the United States, in Washington, D.C., try and stay away because it doesn't always turn out, turn out so well. So I come back to a point I mentioned earlier. I don't have to much dwell much on it. <clears throat> it's called carrots and sticks. Are you going to try and move your private sector, your industry, by giving carrots, that is subsidies, like to chips? Or are you going to do it by sticks, by which I, I mean regulatory demand pull efforts? And uh, the, the best place to look at this is in about carbon emissions. We keep on giving great subsidies to companies to try and develop lower carbon emitting technologies. Uh, and the result is that if you look in the United States, the cost of buying a carbon right for emission is I, I think around 30 bucks today. And here in, 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 Ca in California, you've got a much more uh, smaller effort in, 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 in Massachusetts. Uh, there's a regional consortium, which I guess, guess California's part of, $35. In Europe, they've made a very strong schedule of reducing the amount of carbon they're allowed to emit throughout Europe, throughout the European Union, and that's resulted in the price over time <clears throat> of an emission, right, has gone up to about 100 bucks. 
This chart, I think, shows 80, but it's now it's, it's gone up to $100. So you're now saying, in Europe, when you make an investment decision because of this pull, this stick, you have either to pay $100 and can you continue to use natural gas, or you can develop another technology which is uh, carbon-free. It's a huge incentive to push you over. It's a very, very important choice that a government has to make. Now, in the United States, we have had several efforts. Uh, actually, the first effort was in the, uh, I guess the first effort was really in the, in, in the Nixon administration about setting a charge for energy or for carbon use. In each case, it's failed, three different occasions. The most recent occasion was the Waxman-Markey bill in 2009 which was uh, passed by the House, but which did not pass the Senate. And the reason these bills come, these come in trouble, because every economist, I hope I'm saying this properly, don't correct me, economists like a carbon tax. It could be a, tax, a, a, a cap and trade system, or it could be a tax, or it could be made equivalent. The idea is if you put a charge on it, which internalizes the external costs, of damage from CO2 emissions, uh, that's the way to efficiently move to the place you want to be, which is to say carbon emissions cost the economy something and need to be uh, introduced into the private sector's thinking uh, as they make investments. However, as a political matter, you've got to make sure that when you have a carbon tax, the first thing anybody who's had experience will tell you if you want to pass a tax in the United States Congress, you better tell them how you're spending the revenue because you're going to get, need the help and support of the people who are going to get the benefit from the revenue of the tax if you're going to have any chance of being able to oppose it, impose a tax uh, on another group. Uh, it's really very, very important. And of course, in the uh, Waxman Markey, in order to get the support in the Congress, they didn't. Uh, have it really be a tax where the, there was an auction of the available uh, emission rights, they really had a period of time for quite some time when they, where they were allocated to different groups that, that had the political, uh, the political juice to get, to get Congress to agree to give them some time. Uh, and finally, you have to remember that when you have a carbon tax, different regions of the country, different communities, different people will be disadvantaged in different ways. And you have to take that into account, or you're not being a, uh, a good steward of the public, public interest. So this question is still not resolved in the United States, but eventually you're going to have to go to some carbon pricing policy, but doing it in a politically astute way and in a socially responsible way. Okay. All of this is really driven by this government policy, is a concern about innovation. How well are we doing at uh, economic competitiveness? How well are we doing at manufacturing and uh, distributing uh, our goods and our services uh, compared to others? And I don't want to spend a good deal of time on this, but it's really a subject which I actually think I believe I've actually spoken about at Stanford or at other times, is how to think about innovation. And what innovation is, is it's, a, it's really a pathway. Anybody, any entity, any sector, any country, if they want to innovate something, they have to go through all these steps, these five steps uh, that I've written out here, they're written out in the chart, from idea creation all the way to deployment in the field. Sometimes you go back, you get feedback loops, that is, you get to deployment and you find something that needs fundamental research from people who are usually involved in idea creation to come and solve your problem in deployment. Sometimes you go to a technology development, a technology demonstration phase, and you see something which you have to go back to the uh, idea creation level and say, we need, a, we need a different way to solve this problem. It won't work. It's not working well in technology development. So it's a complicated loop, but you've got to go through all those steps. Sometimes you do it quickly. Sometimes it takes a long, long time. Uh, it, this this uh, uh, early stage creation, idea creation, has been the absolute place where the United States has been the leader. And we've been the leader because it's an open system. 
It's an open system with this great cooperation between private corporations and uni universities, great support for the government from the government for uh, research and education in these uh, in our universities, uh, a very good intellectual property system, and uh, plenty of venture uh, capital. Uh, why do we know this? Because all f many for many years, foreign students wanted to come to the United States. They wanted to come to the United States so they could learn with how the American, systems, American system innovates. And many of them stay here, but also many of them go back to their uh, home countries to contribute there. Uh, the real problem with what some of these, uh, some of these actions that Congress is taking, this uh, suspicion of the relationship of the open university to China, is that it threatens the openness of our system. And the question that has to be asked is the cost of putting constraints on the university worth the advantages you get from slowing the spread of ideas to other places. And I believe, I certainly believe that they, uh, we've, we're, we're on the verge, we're on the verge, we've passed the place where we've made a smart assessment of how much the loss of information to China because of our open system, how much that's hurting us in relation to the benefits that keeping that system open uh, conveys to our country. And everybody still believes the US system is better than anyone else's. My final chart down there in another color is to say, look, I've talked to you about the uh, attitude towards innovation in the third column on that chart, which we have today because of climate change and the other reasons, China and innovation. How the different features, the different characteristics of what we're seeking from innovation in that today when we're dealing with climate change compared to the first column, which is at the end of the Second World War, when all kinds of new technology was sprouting out of the Defense Department, ARPANET, uh, microelectronics, uh, communications, digital uh, electronics. Uh, so there's so much technology coming out that you could characterize the first post-war period as technology push. And today we are very much in the third column of goal orientation to how we are managing our infrastructure uh, activity. I believe this is my final charge, chart. Uh, and uh, what it says is, all right, we really, if we, we, we're going to do this seriously, if we're going to have this period of industrial, serious industrial policy, great expansion, the important thing is it gets implemented properly. It's not just money. The trillions of dollars are obviously there that the, uh, our, our leaders are willing to spend it. It has to be uh, uh, implemented properly. And legislation can't take care of that. The White House and implementation are contradictory ideas. So the question is, what does the implementation require? So I, on this chart, I don't, don't intend to go through it in any detail. There are uh, 10 items which are required to successfully inf implement an aggressive and ambitious uh, industrial policy such as the one that has been provided to us uh, by the Congress of the United States and uh, the Biden administration. Now, you can't pick and choose. You can't say, I need three of them. All 10 are necessary, in my judgment. All 10, to one degree or another, must be in place if you're going to have a uh, successful <coughs> industrial policy implementation. So uh, what, what happens too often to us is we turn to policy, <coughs> especially public policy, and we forget that the policy has to be implemented, not only has to be implemented efficiently, it has to be implemented fairly. And that uh, is the uh, final message that I want to leave you with. When you hear these proposals on industrial policy, stop for a moment and reflect on whether, it's, whether we have in place in our agencies uh, in the public sector uh, the experience and the skills and the tools necessary to implement it properly. So with that, I finish my comments. I look forward to hearing 
uh, questions or comments or differences from any and all of you. So please. Great. Thanks very much, Don. <laughs> so we do have a, some time for questions here. Any questions from the audience here? Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us again, John. Uh, you mentioned there's several threats posed to the United States from China. Can you help us understand what is exactly a threat? Is it privacy? Is it competition? Fairness? The question was regarding more detail about the threats that the U.S. face from China in this debate and your own opinion on those. Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, it does deserve a clear answer. I mean, uh, or some clear thinking about it. But uh, let me just give you two or three. Uh, I do think that there is a, uh, a real competition for global influence with if the economic balance of power between our country, well, even in Asia, just let's restrict it to Asia, uh, shifts towards China even more. But I think uh, you could make a, a significant correct argument that that shift of economic power um, lead, would lead to much more difficult and constrained circumstances for the countries which are around China in the East, in, in, in Asia. And the recent formation of this, what is it called, Quad? Quad. The U.S., India, Australia, and Japan uh, forming to look at in, uh, economic circumstances, market circumstances generally helps us. That's one. Uh, an irritating, continual, serious issue uh, is Taiwan. Uh, that is not a solved problem, and there's much evidence <coughs> and much speculation that it's unraveling a bit. Uh, the third, uh, I'm less, well, I won't say that. The third is the issue about how China is dealing with dissent within China or in Hong Kong or with, with, with the Uyghurs, and that it is not, <coughs> quote, uh, a democratic society. The Chinese, uh, you know, they're just a lot, just a lot more historically sophisticated than we are. Uh, and there are places where they realize <clears throat> that it's important for them to have, for their world standing, close relationships with the United States. So, for example, their cooperation with us on the issue of climate has been uh, quite prominent. And uh, the I'm going to say this properly. The, the, the statement by Xi and Obama uh, was really one of the great events. So there are places where we still cooperate with China. But it's very much more, there are many, many places where we're in competition. That's really what I should say about threat. I'm, I'm less concerned about their 200 intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear and nuclear ballistic missiles. Good. Uh, other questions from the audience? I have one. Uh, did I understand correctly you were going to produce a book on this topic sometime soon? Is that a rumor? Or well, there, no, there, there are two remarks there. The sometime soon is certainly not anything I've said, but the answer to the first one is yes, there, that's certainly true. Yeah. Another one, the audience might be interested. We have this local congressman you may know about, Ro Khanna. I think he has a book coming out, and it is kind of very different perspective on some of the same issues, and it really focuses on the distributional outcomes that you mentioned and solutions to those. So I think I saw him interviewed, and he said, if you don't fix those problems, you're going to be in a position where you're going to have periodic uh, popular revolts going on, quote, unquote, unquote. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I've a couple of times I know I've said in this brief set of comments here that you have to worry about community and regional impacts, but uh, a Quite interesting study has just been completed by MIT by my uh, friend uh, Ernie Moniz, the former Secretary of, Def of Energy, and uh, it's called the Roosevelt Project. And what uh, the, they did, what uh, I was, uh, was on the steering committee, uh, divided the country into five regions and asked what would be the effect, what is the effect <clears throat> on those five regions of moving towards uh, a net zero carbon economy. <clears throat> and they looked at cert certain places like <clears throat> the Gulf Coast, and they looked at other places like Detroit, and they looked at New Mexico, 
And of course, all of these regions have vastly different impacts from a net zero economy and how it's actually structured. And uh, the, not hard to say that if you uh, don't take this into account, you either are lo losing people who would really should be strong proponents of moving to net zero, or you're gaining enemies who say, look, it's good, this is going to impair me much, much worse than somebody who lives in Boston. And so uh, the, uh, you, the, making sure that they have a, uh, that all regions and different kinds of groups have a place at the table and an opportunity to say what's in their interest and what isn't is a very important thing. I quite agree with that. I don't know the congressman. Great. Uh, we're just about out of time here. I'd, I'd like to uh, remind the audience, oh, is there another question? One more. I have a question about how do we mobilize the military to take more of an active role in advocating for climate policy, given how the military historically has taken more of a non-partisan approach to policy on climate? Well, uh, first of all, you, you, I, I was Deputy Secretary of Defense for a couple of years, and uh, you have here at, at, um, at, Am at Stanford, my boss, Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, uh, we might have different answers to this, but uh, I'm not keen on having the uh, Defense Department start uh, advocating positions, important public policy positions. That's not their business. And historically, they've been very reluctant to, but there's no question that there are consequences for the military. But to have them speak out on it, if that was your question, I think would be a quite different thing. But there certainly is clearly uh, consequences of climate change that they're well, they're well aware of, as is, as is the intelligence community. But you don't want to have um, the U.S. military lobbying on what will be seen as lobbying on important public policy issues, in my judgment. So they could, just to clarify, so one thing they could do is clarify some of the trade-offs they're facing amongst this set of objectives and many others that they face? Well, it's not a question that, that they're trading it off. They're just saying, look, uh, if there's going to be climate change, uh, there's going to be drought in, uh, let's say, Africa. That means that there's going to be migration in Africa. That means that yeah. there's going to be conflict in Africa. That means we're going to have to be there. Yeah. That's so it's, that, yeah, the implications. It's a threat assessment. Huh? It's, it's a threat assessment, yeah. but it's not, it's not something where uh, I think you say, and therefore we need to spend more money on it. So we ought to shut down the public part. Unfortunately, uh, John will Thank be you. here through the end of March, correct? Right. And if you look on the Energy Seminar website, you'll see a couple of other talks that he's got queued up for the time that he'll be here. Uh, with that, thanks for that eye-opening and provocative talk as usual, John Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you.